this is Adriana Hopkins with ABC7, and I am thrilled to join you for PGC MLS this week, an overview of upcoming opportunities to learn and connect with each other through the Prince George's County Memorial Library System. Obama inaugural poet Richard Blanco discusses his latest collection of poems, How to Love a Country, on Sunday, November 1st at 8 p.m. Code Your Own App is part of the Maryland STEM Festival. Grow your small business with free online resources. Celebrate Halloween with a spooky story. Enjoy Kolar's Mother Ghost nursery rhymes for little monsters. Place holds on books, movies, and mobile hotspots for curbside pickup, and a whole lot more this week with the Prince George's County Memorial Library System. Check out these resources and events at the Prince George's County Memorial Library System, www.pgcmls.info. Well, good evening. Hello, hello, hello. We hope you enjoyed that little segment from Adriana Hopkins from WGLA, who's one of our fabulous supporters and partners here at the library. Um, we are back for the Elephant We Don't See, a diversity dialogue month five, six, seven, something like that. We're, uh, we're, we're getting educated together um, by being open and, and, and get, getting better about a lot of different things here in the community. So uh, we are grateful for all of you are joining us. Um, before we get started, I just want to introduce my two wonderful, illustrious colleagues, uh, Kyla Hannington, who is the Outreach Coordinator for the Prince George's County Human Relations Commission. Hello, Kyla. Um, she has books for days in there behind her. It's quite delightful. Um, and then uh, our other featured guest tonight is Michelle Hamiel, who's the COO for Public Services at the Prince George's County Memorial Library System and an all-around legend in library world for helping us get um, a little bit better with with things like equity, diversity, inclusion, and anti-racism. So um, I know that you are all in for a great uh, rewarding discussion tonight. Hope you can chime in on the chat as we go. Um, this is our last uh, session with Elephant We Don't See for the fall. We're taking a little break for November and December, and then we'll be back with you to let you know what's coming up next in 2021. Um, wish you all uh, safe and healthy next week as we get through the election. Whoa, hope you vote, that's important. Um, if you did not register to vote yet, you can register on site at any early voting or regular voting site. Um, please note that the locations are different this year because of COVID. Uh, the library is not hosting voting, but um, you can visit our website, pgclmos.info, to get all of the details. And I think I will leave it at that, and I will turn you over to why are all the black kids sitting together in the cafeteria? Question mark, 20th anniversary edition. Take it away, Kyla and Michelle. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Nick. Um, this is by far the best book we've read. Um, there's so much in this book. It is, I'm going to say, a deep dive with snippets, does, if that makes sense. Um, because what, um, what's the name, Beverly Tatum has done, Dr. Beverly Tatum has done, is... Um, attempted to answer why are all the black kids sitting together in the cafeteria by showing you different pieces of history, um, different cultures, by examining different experiences. And I mean, she covers a little bit of everything um, from how persons of color are identified in census data, um, school deseg desegregation, LGBTQ, Mexican segregation, um, losses endured by American Indians. And um, I could go on and on about what she covers, um, but the book really whets your appetite to learn more about other people and about your own culture. In fact, I was telling Kyla, um, because I'm a librarian, I fact check. And she stated in this book that in 1920, the United States government stopped identifying African Americans as mulatto. Well, I was pretty certain that my great grandmother had been identified as mulatto. So I checked the 1920 census, and sure enough, my grandmother was not, great grandmother was not identified as mulatto. Um, so she's in the sense that she's black. My great grandfather is listed as black, but their daughter, my great aunt, 
was listed as mulatto. So I don't know how that could be, whether my great grandmother, because she had always been called mulatto, um, identified her daughter as such, or if whoever was taking that information identified my great aunt as mulatto. Um, so like I said, it, she just kind of whets your appetite. Um, and uh, Kala and I think that, um, you know, Kala and I think that this was one of the most thought provoking. We had this long conversation yesterday. We kind of get together on the Monday before we um, meet with all of you to talk about the book. Um, yeah. I think we do it a little bit sooner, but we thought it was very thought provoking. I thought it was very relevant even today because the black kids are sitting together in the cafeteria um, and it's insightful. And I think um, a lot of times when people from other cultures gather together and I've actually had this said to me um, that there are some Latinx people who had gathered and there was a white woman who was extremely upset that they were they had gathered and were speaking in their own language. Um, and sometimes that's intimidating to people. Sometimes people th feel threatened by that. And sometimes they even get downright angry. Um, and I think what this book does is to encourage you to know more about yourself um, before you start to go down the path of being angry and feeling intimidated. And it made me think of the quote, um, before you judge a man, walk a mile in his shoes or walk a mile in his moccasins. And what that really means. And I thought about how really this book would help us empathize with others, I think is the, the best way. She gives us enough that it makes you wanna go read about other cultures or other people, other um, times in other uh, times in history, um, just so that you can empathize with what was going on at that time. And I'm not gonna take a whole lot of time, but the other thing that this did for me is um, so Brown versus when she talks about um, desegregation of public schools and Brown versus Board of Ed occurred in 1954. And um, Baltimore City Schools, I'm a product of Baltimore City Public Schools, Baltimore Public City Public Schools did not integrate until 10 years after that. And I was in middle school a few years after that, I'm not gonna tell you all my age, but a few years after that, I was in middle school. And my first, I was in the first middle school in Baltimore City. And it was going to be my first experience in an integrated school. I didn't think much of it. I came home from school and my mother who had taken off from work that day was standing in the kitchen door and as soon as I walked through the door, and it was normal to, for her to ask me how was school, but she wanted to know how did I get treated? Um, how many white kids were in my class? You know, my answers were, oh, I don't know. Um, what did they say to you? Did they talk to you? Did you eat with them? It, so I thought those questions were really strange, but I really wasn't that far removed from integration. And I was telling Kyla, the strange thing is, I really cannot remember any of the white kids in my middle school. Saying all that, and Nicola hasn't said a thing. So I told her I wasn't going to talk. I could talk all night about this book and what this book did for me. But I promise you all, I know you don't want to hear from me. So, Kyla. Well, I think <laughs> what did you think? I want to hear from you. I, so, I'll, speaking for everybody, I'll say we do want to hear from you for sure. But I will say, well, everybody's watching from home. I absolutely agree with what um, Michelle has said. This book, um, you know, we've read a number of books now, which we'll, I'm sure through the course of tonight, we'll talk about other books that we've read. Um, a lot of you have been with us for those, so you know what they are, but there's no question that this book is just a foundational piece. It's, it's just wonderful. And um, I want to give a shout out to Michelle, because when we put this um, diversity dialogue together, it was the first book that she recommended and also the first, the, the book that she most wanted to start with. And we actually had it booked for June 30th. This was supposed to be our June 30th book. Um, but we, uh, with in collaboration, 
you know, the library, our office, uh, and a, a few at Joe's Movement Emporium and the Maryland State Library, a few other agencies collaborated to bring Dr. Ibram Kendi in to speak on July 20th. And so we switched our, this book out for this book and we read this on June 30th. So it has taken us a long time to be able to get back here. And um, I will say, I'm glad that we've read all the books that we've read, but it would have been really something to have done this um, series starting with this, because I think it is, I loved it. I loved did, did, you, did you say what I wanted to read, Kyla? Did you say that this was what did I, I not, wanted? Did I, not, did I not say that? I think, I did. I think let the record show that I said, let the record show that this was Michelle's <laughs> first show. And she, she gets total credit. So um, it is such a good, it was such a, such a good book, such a great choice and highly recommend. Um, there was, I do feel like we could talk about this for three nights. I really do. Like we could yeah. just. I know how to start like what I want to say right now because I'm looking at the time and thinking oh my gosh we have to um <laughs> we have to sorry I just saw the ticker um we have to um you know sort of be <sighs> focused and I guess one, one thing because the most recent book that we read I will I will say this the most recent book that we read was White Fragility and those people who are here tonight who joined in when we talked about this last month may recall that neither Michelle nor I we're super huge fans of that book. I think I can safely say that. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. Interesting because in this book, she has several chapters that deal with, you know, developing racial identity, um, the development of white identity, um, and, and just sort of several chapters that I, I experienced her doing what white fragility sort of claimed that it did or wanted to do, but in such a way that really looks at um, providing um, suggestions of books about white uh like white racial identity which is something that i don't necessarily know that a lot of i mean i'll speak for myself i haven't read those those she has lists in here about um books that she recommends that i have not i, mean, I haven't read any of them becky thompson's a promise in a way of life white anti-racist activism when race becomes real, black and white writers confront their personal histories white like me waking up white and finding myself in the story of race witnessing whiteness and I mean, it goes on and on. And I, and what I found really helpful about that as a white person reading this was, and also helpful, but also kind of illuminating was recognizing that in my life, I have read a lot about other cultures, whether other, um, whether it's literature, fiction, art, you know, getting empathy and understanding through art um, or, nonfiction books about other groups what i have not done has done that study on my own um racial identity and as i was saying to michelle because michelle as you know we did talk we did talk behind the scenes as i said some of that i think has been because in my own thinking i get it all the time what's the what's the of english literature it's white men you know it's just i mean it's constant like what's political history white men like whiteness is everywhere so i don't really i never felt like i should or needed to study whiteness because it was like it was just everywhere all the time and what i if i wanted to learn i had to learn about other things and this is a very long way of saying this book was very illuminating to me and helpful to me about directing me and encouraging me to read also about whiteness and what that means in that racial construct that's my opening. <laughs> um, so, you know, I even thought about, um, someone said to me, you know, in all of the EDIA work um, that I do is how come you don't, and we talked about this in one of our discussions, you don't include much on LGBTQ. And, um, and I talked about that. And I did not remember, because I actually read the first edition in the 90s so probably around 95 um and um i thought about that and and but what this book made me do is think about some a conversation that i'd had with my friend who said that even in the lgbtq community white old men are in power and so um, this book even talks about the fact that 
um, you know, we're talking about why do all the black kids sit together in um, the cafeteria, but it doesn't just deal with black kids, but it really is you sit with or meet with those you are comfortable with. And it says, and even within the black community, um, LGBTQ people don't necessarily feel like they are represented. And um, so you would probably find that they would sit together in the cafeteria. But um, I asked my kids, and I, I went back to see how long this discussion happened. I, I just threw the question out there um, and said, who'd you sit with in the cafeteria and why? And the conversation started at 2.42, all in text. I was really trying to work, uh, <laughs> but the text just started going. Um, the conversation started at 2.42 and the last response came to me at 5.43. And um, you know, my son went off and started talking to his friends, but I thought, so my son was the first to respond. So I asked my son, my daughter-in-law and my daughter, and then my son asked several of his friends. Um, but my son's first thought was, so I think it's because of who we interact with socially. Often schools are mixed, but neighborhoods are not, families are not, et cetera. For example, I went to Sudbrook, which is a mixed school, but came home to Powhatan which isn't mixed at all. My family isn't mixed. I was used to white folks in class and on sports teams, but not so much in social settings. Who we sit with at lunch at the lunch table is a choice. And I think people gravitate to where they are comfortable. So my daughter-in-law said her response was familiar, familiarity, sameness, common culture, common struggles, same belief systems. And um, she goes on to say that, well, she has a more diverse um, group of friends. And um, she said um, that she had plenty of white friends in high school, college, and in her PhD program. Um, so I said, okay, so what's your theory? <laughs> she, said, she, don't, she said, I don't know. Um, it seems so long ago, but I do know my, her, um, well, we were talking about something else. We slipped something else in there. And then, so basically what she came to is she hung out with cheerleaders or the nursing students. And mainly because we had a common interest. She says, so the same applies for race, common interest. Now um, we talked about, I said, well, she has a friend named Sarah. I said, but you don't consider Sarah your home girl. She said, Sarah is my home girl. Sarah's white. She said, Sarah is my home girl. She said, um, but, you know, Sarah is extremely privileged, is aware of her privilege. She said, and Sarah is a Trump supporter from West Virginia. She said, <laughs> but they are friends. The, her thing is, though, you'd have to know my daughter-in-law. Um, Lisa will call you on her stuff and she, on your stuff. And she didn't, she didn't say stuff. She said, but she will call you on your stuff. And she said that she even has a friend from her PhD program named Jake, who just a couple of weeks ago actually thanked her one for sitting with him when they were in school and calling him on his mess because he is so much more aware of who he is and how he treats people because she did call him on his stuff. And my daughter-in-law has no problem sitting at anyone's table, striking a conversation. I call it, she's probably more like you. It's like, hey, there's a group of people I don't know. I'll go talk to them. And, <laughs> but the other thing, so my daughter said the same thing, that she has, has diverse friends. And she said, but again, she was a cheerleader. She tutored. So it was one of those situations where she met, she said, and for her, she said, I um, interacted with the, ma um, the majority of my friends were black. She said, but she interacted with anyone. She said, um, so she said, basically it was whoever I wanted to sit with at the time and who was talking about something interesting. But my son's friend, uh, one of his friends said, in my opinion, I think it could be a combination of things. I think the initial reason is self-relatability and identity. 
you typically gravitate towards what you identify most within yourself. I also think it could also be symbolic of self-pride and self-identity. We can also be very aware of other environments, but still chose to sit at the black table because of pride of culture, status, etc. Cetera. Branching out can be a good thing, but I think self-pride in knowing that it's all right also to stick with your own black table is just as acceptable as branching out if you feel more comfortable elsewhere. But some sit at the black table out of fear of the other unknown tables, cultures, and some branch out because of fear or neglect from embracing or even feeling welcomed at their own black table culture. That's like in the book on page, um, for those of you who have the new edition, page 142, she talks about this, I, this, um, this experience or the idea of, of, okay, why, answering the question, why are all the black kids sitting together at the cafeteria? And of course, one of the things she says is, why is that even a question? In the sense that if you had a school that was minority white, and the white kids were sitting together in the cafeteria, would there be such a question about it that there is in schools that are minority black where the black kids are sitting together? So she even questions, I mean, the the, the book itself, I think, even questions the question. But, mm -hmm. you know, as you're sharing those, that conversation, you know, she's, it, there's a part of the very end of page 142 where she says, um, in much the same way, this eighth grade girl's white friend doesn't get it. So I'm skipping over the part she doesn't get, but um, she doesn't see the significance of the racial message, but the girls at the black table do. When she tells her story there, one of them is likely to say, you know what, Mr. Smith said the same thing to me yesterday. Not only are the black adolescents encountering racism and reflecting on their identity, but their white peers, even when they are not the perpetrators, and sometimes they are, are unprepared to respond in supportive ways the black students turn to each other for the much needed support they are not likely to find anywhere else. And I think that's mm -hmm. what I got out of this section, this essay, um, that sort of answers the title, that examines the title question of the book, um, which is the in-group understanding. And it's not necessarily that, you know, if you're, and she uses examples of, and you mentioned, you know, um, LGBTQ plus, or, or you have groups of women in a minority uh, female setting that, so to be in a situation where you are able to share experiences, and in this case, mm -hmm. some negative experiences that you're feeling at the hands of the dominant group with people who are going to understand and not minimize and not discount, that that explains, and this, and you know, she talks about this, and this, this section, Why Are All the Black Kids Sitting Together in the Cafeteria, is the subtitle of the chapter titled Identity Development in Adolescence, and she really unpacks it, or I understood her, and packing it as this part of like a, a healthily formed identity is healthy racial pride. Mm -hmm. um, I think she does a really good job about showing the importance of that for all groups. Um, and I think that goes back to her asking the question about why, why is this even a question? Like, why is it an object of concern for people that all the black kids are sitting together in the cafeteria? Mm -hmm. You know, her. I understood her to say, "I'm not really sure that that's a problem." You know, and um, because looking at this as identity building and identity reflecting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, in the chapter on racial identity in adulthood, um, the same thing happens in corporate cafeterias. Right. And um, it was the corporate cafeteria where I experienced someone saying they were really upset that this group of Latinx um, adults were sitting together and speaking in their own language. And, um, you know, in corporate America, I think it may even be um, a little worse because um, you have less of an opportunity to find the commonalities. So, um, you know, you, when you go to lunch, you choose, sometimes you're leaving the building. So you don't have that opportunity to sit with anyone else and really get to know people. Um, and now with COVID, you really don't have that opportunity. Um, so you are going to gravitate to who you think you have the most in common 
with, right. especially having experienced some of the things that African Americans experience while at work. But I think that this book says, stop questioning that and learn a little bit more about your own self <laughs> and be proud of who you are. So right. that's self-pride and um, maybe you would learn to respect others a little bit more. Um, and if um, you don't want to start with your own because you think you know everything, this book will give you some a little taste to make you want to learn about others. I, I for me, first of all, I mean, I think this book. So I think this book came out twenty five years ago, but I'm having the response. Where have you been all my life? <laughs> been on the bookshelf, Kyla. So um, no, this is just such a foundational work, and. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things that I'm looking forward to doing is having read this, sit in this, or probably even reread this one again, you know, give it a couple of weeks, read it again. And then it would be interesting to look at some of the other ones that we had read. And so like, example, I won't keep holding books up, but I probably will. This one we both really loved. So this is yes. the Spark, the um, diver Inclusion and Diversity Dialogue. And we both really like this, but I'm wondering what it would be like to have this as a found, you know, this in the foundation and then put this book and the understanding from this book on top of that. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know. I just experienced this book as, as really taking everything to the next level. Like in, in um, it was, it was just the whole time that I was reading it, I just felt like it was very clear. Everything that she was saying was making sense. So you're a librarian. I'm a history. Mm -hmm. So I have the same thing, which is like, okay, <laughs> let me yeah. look this up. Um, and actually I've just been, so there's breaking news, breaking news from this morning. Um, I've been accepted to do a, a master's of arts degree in human rights. And um, Yay, congratulations. Very so, so I just finished an MFA. So I'm like, time to go to the next thing. So, but, um, but one of the things that I really wanted to do in that was to look at the impact of colonization on the colonizer. You know, my mm -hmm. is on First Nation studies, um, so Canadian um, First Nation studies, and I thought it would be interesting to look at that, but from the view of like, what's the, you know, instead of othering, right, to look at what's the impact on the colonizer or from a human rights perspective, because we certainly know that the, the anyway, that's a whole other story. But my point in that is that I think that this book, when I look at that, this idea of, it intersects with this idea of, um, to some extent, addressing your own your own self, and that does not mm -hmm. preclude, and in no way does it preclude being interested and learning about people who are other than you. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's important. I mean, and that is endless work. You know, I mentioned before arts or or nonfiction books. Like you could read forever from um, artists who did not grow up like you grew up, mm -hmm. and I think is so important and I, but I was really, really interested by her encouragement to all people, um, like that the, the idea of familial pride or racial pride or ethnic pride as in terms of like a healthy, a development of a healthy self-identity, mm -hmm. really, really important. Um, and I think you go back to the question, like, to imply there's something wrong with all the black kids sitting together in the cafeteria would be then to imply that there is something wrong with black kids developing a healthy sense of a, a healthy sense of racial identity. Uh -huh. And uh -huh. I thought that was, a like, I appreciated her tackling that question and also framing it like that so that the, all of us reading it can, can even just question why do we presume that that's a problem? Right. Right. Um, and it, well, the other thing that I, I keep mentioning is the the history that's here. And, um, you know, like when, when I read the book and I, I was trying to find it in the book, but it talked about Mexican dis desegregation um, and a, a point in, it was the equivalent of our Jim Crow. And, um, and I don't know where it was. I thought I turned the page down, but I must not have. In any case, so now I want to read about um, that part of history. Um, because when I think of desegregation, the only, 
you know, I, I know that there were injustices against um, people for religion, but when I think of desegregation, I really think about um, African Americans being um, segregated. And um, I, this was just so eye opening. Cause like I said, I read this in the nineties and came back and found so much more. Um, I'm actually gonna have to look at my book from the nineties to see actually what's different. Um, Cause I don't remember that piece of it. I don't remember it being so rich in the history with just snippets. Mm -hmm. um, the, um, and essentially what she talks about is all of the oppression that has occurred throughout history and, and to different groups of people. Um, you know, I asked my husband the question, why do you think all the black kids um, sit together in the cafeteria? So he grew up in a predominantly white community. And I asked him, did you sit, because he has a lot of white friends. And so I asked him, who'd you sit with in the cafeteria? He said, black kids. So mm -hmm. I said, um, he said, every now and then he may sit with someone else, but it was mainly just like my son said, they played sports. Um, they had something else in common. Um, but he said when he moved into that community, um, it was, I mean, he was one of the first families to move into the community that he lived in. He said, walking through the neighborhood, he had bottles and cans thrown at him. He had um, police asked him for his green card to walk the neighborhood. And I mean, he was eight years old. And so he didn't even know what they were talking about. He, you know, a green card, what green card? Um, and so he said, while well, he had friends and he said his neighbors were very, very nice. Um, but he knew that he couldn't trust everyone. And so in school, there was always this hesitancy that if he sat with them, um, could he trust them? You know, what else, you know, were they gonna be the same ones to throw bottles or cans? He said, so that always ran in the back of his mind. And um, he said, so, you know, back then, he said, that's who he would have sat with. He said, but thinking back, he said the people who were the most welcoming, he said, because most of it, most of the white students were um, Jewish. He said, and the ones who were the nicest were the Jewish students and probably because their families identified closely with the black experience. Mm -hmm. um, he said, but that's all in hindsight. It was, you know, and that's who he was mainly friends with. It was those, um, people who were um, Jewish and not necessarily um, however anyone else identified. So I thought that was interesting. You know, mm -hmm. it's it, all of this is really about what you've been exposed to. Um, you know, like right. my son said, you know, how you grew up, what, what, what happened in your household. Right. Right. And I think, yeah. and I think, and you've done a good job of, of also expressing that there can be a difference about what happens in school versus what's mm -hmm. in the neighborhood versus what's happening in your house. Mm -hmm. and, you know, if those things are <sighs> equitable, like what's happening in school is the same as happens in the neighborhood and same that happens in the house. And, and there's, there's a great diversity in all of those circles. You are going to have a very different experience. Um, and as you're talking mm -hmm where you sit and who you sit with is going to feel very differently than right. come from segregated space. And if that segregated mm -hmm. space is your household is segregated or um, your neighborhood or your school. Um, yeah. And I think that these, um, I'm trailing off because I, I have so many. <laughs> so I really, sometimes I think, sometimes I feel like the first conversation should be the conversation we have now. Be like, I know. Because what no. happens when we get on the phone, we're like, shh, 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 shh. And so, <laughs> it's because we try to like map it out for you folks. So we sound a little bit more organized than we maybe are right now. Um, but there's so much to talk about in this. And I think, and I found the page, which I've now flipped away from um, the part about the history. Um, I think you're looking at 238, 239. Oh, that's the page of one. Okay. Yeah. Is that, did you find it? 238, 239? Mm -hmm. It gives the, um, the history of, of how Mexicans were treated and the changing ways in which uh, 
Mexican folks were treated by the American mm -hmm. government. And she does that a few times, like showing where there were different groups that were given, I mean, I hate to even use the word given, but that they were treated in a sort of quasi equitable way by the um, American government only mm -hmm. to have that, that quasi equity taken away um, at, a, at a later time. And that sort of seems yeah. to happen with like multiple different, multiple groups of people have experienced, it seems like have, have had that happen, whether it's sort of quasi acceptable and then not acceptable. Yeah, I'm trying to find this book. I just talked about it um, uh, with Nick uh, yesterday. And I do is this, I told him I can never remember. Is oh, it in here? Killers, no, it's no. It just, okay. I'll um, stop skimming. Look at it, okay. um, Native Americans. And, um, you know, you think about what's happened to Native Americans and, um, you know, and she talks about, you know, they were here, we came over. I mean, well, not we, we I did not. Um, <laughs> Europeans came over, um, brought disease and killed them off. Those they did not kill off. They gave them a little piece of land, but um, the- um, I'm shaking a, my head. Oh, I'm shaking my head because they didn't give them anything. Yeah, this is true. They stole. So All kinds this of is things. true, right? No, yes. no, I didn't nobody give them anybody anything. Um, yeah, and, but continue. But I just like I want to just. But if, there's a book. If you're looking this? for something, no, it is called Killer. Okay, there of it is. The Flower Moon. And I found it, Nick. <laughs> it's like a competition, but you can't beat Nick. But I, I if well, we're on this topic, I have a book to recommend. Um, so Thomas King is an American-born Canadian. And he wrote this book called The Inconvenient Indian. And it takes you through the history in both Canada and the United States because the countries have similarities, but also differences. Oh. The way that First Nations people, the First Nations people relationship to the crown or the state and, and vice versa, com, you know, comparing and contrasting between both countries. But mm -hmm. I have to say if folks are, interested in learning more again just like a foundational text was, i mean i could i could recommend books about this for hours but this is a wonderful foundational book it's called inconvenient it's indian the, the inconvenient indian by thomas king it is very disturbing so when i say it's wonderful i say that acknowledging that it's um it's going to be very upsetting you'll be very upset all of, when i say you i mean absolutely anybody who's listening to me right now who chooses to read this book <laughs> will be very upset but in terms of providing information, I think it's excellent, excellent. As I was reading this, it made me think, you know, for people who want to do more research, this is a great a great place to start. Yeah, and this book, The Killers of the Flower Moon, is about the Asaje um, murders and the birth of the FBI. Um, the Asaje, Asaje, and I have, I apologize if I'm saying it wrong, um, but it's the, it's O-S-A-G-E. Um, were among the wealthiest people in these United States. And um, there was oil on their land. And the big oil companies were coming in and they were trying to get the land. And many of the um, people who were on the land were smart. So they weren't giving them the land. And those big oil companies started killing these um, Native Americans off. This was, I mean, true history, um, never talked about. Um, it was an eye-opening read. Um, and it just, it, it made you think of what has happened in our history that has created um, so much dissension among races and cultures and um, and how people came into power and privilege and, and what that means. Um, we read another book and I know this is off topic, but uh, we just did some equity and diversity training and we went back to a book that we read, What If I Say the Wrong Thing? And it um, we had to check off our places of privilege. And most of us have, um, and most middle-class people have 
more places, uh, more points of privilege than not. Um, but I was mentioning how in some environments, I have never felt privileged, although I had a lot of privilege. Um, but given how I have had to navigate this life and my professional life, I have never felt privileged. And I think that is probably true for most persons of color um, that, you know, we can, we know inherently that we are privileged because of all the things that, you know, we have a degree and may have come from a two parent household, um, you know, any number of things. Um, you may have gone to top 20 school, but whatever your privilege is, your skin color often denotes um, your place in society. And that is what people are going to see first. And in order to feel a sense of pride, you probably will gravitate with people who have had similar experiences or people you can identify with so that you are not demoralized every day of your life. Um, and I think that, because I, I also want to throw the question out to those listening, but I also wanted to share, and I know I should, said that I would share this at the end, Kyla, but I'm going to go ahead and read this now from, it's on page 339, Finding Courage for Social Change. Breaking the silence undoubtedly requires courage. How can we find the courage we need? This is a question I ask myself a lot because I too struggle with fear. I am aware of my own vulnerability, even as I write this book. What will writing it mean for my life? Will it make me a target for attack? How will readers respond to what I have to say? Have I really said anything helpful? And I'm gonna pause there and say, yes, she has. <laughs> Silence feels safer, but in the long run, I know that it is not. So I, like so many others, need courage. I look for it in the lives of others, seeking role models for how to be an effective agent of change. That, I thought, was so wonderful um, because she even admitted that it took courage to write this book for fear that, I mean, she's a, um, she was the Dean. I don't know if she still is. Yeah. Oh, she is president emerita of Spelman college. And, um, I can only imagine to, first of all, bring out another edition, um, and what that might mean. And to point out so many awful times in history, when you have books like How to Be an Anti-Racist telling you that you have to work at being an anti-racist and she pretty much says, no, you need to take a look at these things in history. So, um, and you and I both kind of felt the same way about Kendi's book too, but there's just so much value in this book. Mm -hmm. And what I also like that White Fragility never did, and I, I think you said it, at least for you, it did not give you a sense of hope. But I think she leaves you with some hope. With all mm -hmm. that she has packed in this book, she still leaves you with a sense of hope. And I, you know, this is our last, as Nick said, this is our last one for this year. You know, we're, we're taking a little November, December break. And I think for the people listening, I'd be, you know, participate in the chat if you're so moved. But I will share a little part of Michelle's and my private conversation yesterday, which was both of us expressing sometimes it can feel like is it are we is the needle moving? Mm. And you know, as Michelle just now as you were sharing that quote, I thought, okay, she wrote this book, you know, 20 years ago, 20 plus 25 years ago. 
and she's really, we you know, sent out a new edition and the new edition has some not very positive updates of things that have happened. I think it was 2017 that she ended, you know, that she updated it up through 2017 mm -hmm. and a lot of contemporary events, 2016, 2017 that are just awful. Mm -hmm. And what was it like for her to be revisiting this work 20 years later and wonder, you know, did she have that sense of like, how has it been for any good at all? And um, I just sort of wanted to share something that I said with Michelle um, yesterday for what it's worth for anyone who's listening who maybe is feeling um, not so hopeful or um, I'll just leave it there. For anyone out there who's maybe not feeling so hopeful, what I will offer is what I live with every day, which is, um, in fact, I can't, change the world. I can't, um, I'm not even a citizen, so I can't vote. Um, I can't, there's so many things I cannot do, but I do fundamentally believe in all of our collective power. And so on an individual, on the individual level, mine, to person to person, you know, boots on the ground, <laughs> relationship by relationship, make positive change. And so I just wanted to, you know, Michelle and I talked about this yesterday, but I really did want to offer it, you know, as we, I think, uh, you know, times are difficult and exhausting. And I think that that sense of like, is it ever going to, is the needle ever going to move um, is a very real question. But I, I just to go off with that message of hope, like I do believe that there's hope. And in, for me, I believe that it is person to person, relationship by relationship. And um I've been so fortunate in my own life to have wonderful relationships like people like Michelle <laughs> and um, and people from whom I have the opportunity to learn. And then hopefully I can take that and share it. Um, you know, hopefully I can share it to somebody else down the, down the road. So I just wanted to offer that. That was a little bit serious, but I also thought we are taking a little bit of a break. Let's end with some, and with some truth, you know? Yeah. Yeah. The, um, I think that, well, I'm just going to be honest. I, I don't feel like the needle is moving. I feel like we are going backwards in time. Um, and I can only do, like you said, I can only do my part. And that is for me to try to put a smile on somebody's face at least once a day. If it's more, then fine. But maybe I can be impactful to someone sometime throughout the day. Um, I think that is why I approach my work the way I do, because I really do believe everybody's important. I really do believe that um, in the library world, we make a difference. I really do believe that we are changing lives one customer at a time, one interaction at a time, one relationship at a time. Um, and sometimes you can't take life too seriously. And um, Nick will tell you, I am always cutting up. Um, I try to make somebody laugh. And in my office, we laugh all day long. Um, um, even when it is time, you know, when I feel like screaming, um, crying, um, kicking a chair, I still try to keep a smile on my face because maybe that will change somebody else's life. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know that we've had any real impact with the books that we've discussed. Um, by discussing the books that we've discussed, but um, I certainly hope that there will be people who will go out and read this one. Right. right. Me too. Yeah. And I do know yeah. that we have a few people who have been with us um, for our whole series, and I really appreciate that. I, you know, I really appreciate people who have tuned in and stayed with us and and have been curious about what we're reading and, and reading along with us, and I think that that's awesome. And I think that that is something to also be hopeful about. Right. It's also mm -hmm. hopeful about, and we talked about this last month when we were reading White Fragility. Like, one of the great things about White Fragility is that it's a bestseller and how to be an anti racist bestsellers. What does that tell you? People want 
to know. They want to learn and want to do better. Right. That is hopeful. Um, mm -hmm. And I think you definitely put a, you put a smile on my face every time I talk to you. So we have a good time, don't we? <laughs> we do have a good time. We do have a good time. I think so. When 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 we're on a hiatus um, on November December, you know, Michelle and I will still be chatting with each other. That's right. Keep the That's keep right. the relationship up. So yeah. I, really quickly, we'd love if you have any questions, we would um, love to hear them. If you want to put them in the chat. Um, are, oh, I have that page marked. Well, I would say that the, um, so the question is, are there books the author recommends to understand white people better? I will say that that is not how the author phrases right. in the book, but um, the answer to that question is yes. Uh, I, I'm interpreting it as a yes. And there's lots, so many on page 202, but I will slowly read a couple at random. I haven't read any of them, so I can't, I'm not personally recommending them, but the author's amazing. So if she does, her, her word is a million times better than mine. So she has Becky Thompson's A Promise of A Promise and Way of Life, White Anti-Racist Activism. Mm -hmm. She has a book called The Education of a Wasp, The Story of Lois Dalby. Yeah. Um and she mentions that one a couple of times in the book. Right. So that's the that's I don't know if Nick, you can put that in the chat. The um The Education of a Wasp, capital W A S P, the story of Lois Stalvey, S T A L V E Y. Um, she also had Tim Wise's book, White Like Me, Reflections on Race from a Privileged Son. Um, she also mentioned the book Waking Up White, but I cannot find the name of that author right now. But Waking Up White is another book that she mentions in here. But there's actually quite a number of books that she mentions on page 202. And two. Yeah. She mentions Memoir of a Race Trader by Mab Segrist. A well, she mentions account. that a few times. Yeah. 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 A account of her experience as a white lesbian with the deep Southern roots, organizing against neo-Nazi and Klan activity in Northern Carolina. I'm glad I, I looked back at this page because I said I wanted to read that. I, I know. I'm going to get I can I'm gonna, only imagine. I'm going to order all of these. And then, and then yeah. you know what we can talk about. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, there's a lot. And I just really wanted to get a really quick overview of other books that we've talked about in case anybody is new. We started with this. This book is called, What If I Say the Wrong Thing? 25 mm -hmm. Culturally Effective People. It was excellent. And we actually read, the, we talked about this book before we started our series. This started, we read this, I think in April, right? Yeah, it was for staff day. Well, it was supposed to be for staff day. And then we read, I'm not sure I'm gonna get them in order. We read How to Be an Anti-Racist by Dr. Mm -hmm. Ken. We read What If, Short Stories to Spark Diversity and Inclusion Dialogue. Mm -hmm. Read Blind Spot. Mm -hmm. This is a book, it's a little dense, but for those of you who are familiar with the um, Harvard Implicit Bias Test, this book is by those same folks who do that testing and it's interesting there. And then we read White Fragility last month. And so that yeah. overview, I guess that's six, seven, one, two, I can't count, six, six books. And then this one here. Yeah. Um, and does anybody have, did we have any questions in the last couple minutes? Anybody have? Uh, oh, Mark Hannington says, Kyla, you went to a high school that prided and prides itself on being culturally diverse and rich. What was that? Was that your experience of it? Yes. So for those keeping score at home, that's my dad. Hi, dad. Um, and uh, I moved to Hawaii when I was 14 um, from a small town in British Columbia. And in, in, um, in my small town of British Columbia, if I, you know, it was very, very, very much majority white. And I experienced life as a white child in a white environment. And when, and, and I think my adult gaze is able to look at that environment and realize that there were people that I was not seeing, but my experience up until the age of 14 was being very white. And then moving to Hawaii was absolutely wonderful experience in terms of changing my worldview. And being in a in an environment where I was a minority, um, in terms of demographic minority, and meeting people from all kinds of different countries and backgrounds and family backgrounds, that I think opened my eyes to a world that I had not previously known. And in terms of my high school, I went to two different high schools in Hawaii, and I think both were 
actually Michelle and I were talking about this yesterday. I was trying to remember like, who did I sit with in the cafeteria? And I realized, but I was in Hawaii. So the reality, the, the, the reality is that that was a very, that those tables were very diverse. Um, and it wasn't, um, at least my experience was, there was not a, at any table that I can think of, there wasn't a majority one group of one group. It was very varied. You have like the goth bench, you know? So it was like more like, like the, the things that maybe one that you had in common in terms of like what you were interested in seemed to be more, more how people clustered. Mm-hmm. Your commonalities. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Anybody else have any questions? Wait, you're muted, Nick. Hey. <laughs> Um, I have a reflection to share if if, if okay. you'll have me. Um, Absolutely. So when I, ba- way back I mentioned to both Kyla and Michelle that I read a, a new YA novel um, that really deals with the topic of this book. Um, and I'm going to pull up the title real quick. It's, um, it's by a woman who it, it was her debut um, YA novel. And she uh, worked as a teacher in Boston Public Schools before. And it's called Don't Ask Me Where I'm From. And it was the first time I've seen a, and this is just because of my own reading background, I'm sure that the story has been depicted elsewhere, but um, a fictional telling of this for a YA audience of, of this very phenomenon and actually like attacking that head on. Um, in Boston, there's a, a program called Metco where folks who live in the city, predominantly black and Latinx folks who are um, bused out to the suburbs to go to the predominantly white schools. And I, I grew up, throughout the area, but um, mostly in a school district that was one of the suburban schools. Um, And my mind was just totally blown by the nuance and perspective to seeing someone who, in the book, the the young woman starts off in a Boston public school, but then gets into the MECO program and starts to go to one of the fictionalized suburbs. And to see her different relationship to herself as a result of the two different contexts where she went from being in the majority and being popular to being suddenly an outsider and not even being accepted by the the kids at the quote unquote Metco table, which is like a real phenomenon that's terrible in many ways, um, but has has its reasons um, with people kind of banding together, um, understandably. And I highly recommend it to, to anyone who wants to keep tackling this subject because it, it really did a lot for my own journey with seeing a, a, or experiencing a fictionalized setting that could then give me a different set of language around um, the ongoing reflections of, the, of how this happens. Um, so we'll, hopefully we'll have the author for an event soon. I just sent an invitation while we've been on the event here. Um, but I highly recommend it. It's called uh, Don't Ask Me Where I'm From. That's okay. all. Thanks. Thank you. There were two books that you recommended while I was read, reading the heavy stuff. You've read some light things. <laughs> um, and I can't remember what the other one was, but we'll, I'll be in the office tomorrow. So I'll, I'll find you. I'll hunt you down <laughs> to get those titles. Michelle knows where I live. <laughs> <laughs> well, you we're up, up, up about at the, the hour. Um, do you both have any parting words for getting getting through the next seven days in our country alive and, and stable? And the only thing that I will say is if you have not registered to vote, please register to vote. If you have not voted or if you're contemplating um, not voting, your life could depend on it. <laughs> so... Um, please, please consider going to vote. Um, and if you um, need a chair uh, or take a chair, we uh, I went down to vote yesterday and the line was so long and I did not have a chair with me. And I purposely waited till like um, 7.30 to go. And the line was still so very long. Um, so I, at some point I'm going to have to go back but I'm taking my chair. Uh, yeah. For, for all of us who can't vote, please vote. Yes. Uh, it has really been great. I have to just thank, I really want to thank um, the Prince George's County Memorial Library System and um, and uh, my friends here, Michelle um, and Nick, uh, 
for putting this together and Michelle for being with me and working and being such a good friend and good sport as we have, I think sometimes challenging, well, not sometimes, often challenging conversations. And, and um, I really appreciate the opportunity and your time and your honesty and your friendship. So thank you. Same here, Kyle. You have no idea how many um, of our uh, talks have left me in tears. <laughs> um, and I have poured out some stuff to you. Um, so thank you for being my friend and um, just being there. This has been great. And thank you, Nick, for coming up with the idea. Mm -hmm. And and at least I think it was your idea. I know what mine. <laughs> oh, I, I just instigate scheduling. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> but this this is great. Great experience. Yeah. Great experience. And um, uh, hopefully we can keep on doing it. And I, I know that we're a little bit over time, but I do see that we have one of um, Human Relations Commission's um, very loyal and, and wonderful um, uh, participants. Um, Susan, I saw Susan um, appear in the chat box and Susan has been, when we had in-person events, she was absolutely wonderful at coming and it's just a pleasure to see you here tonight and I wanted to give you a shout out. So thank you for being here. Thank you, Susan. <laughs> Kyla, did you want to plug um, some upcoming events. I do. Do you want to start with the one on November 1st and then sure. I'll, I'll jump in? Yeah. Okay. So we are super, super excited because we have a very distinguished author and poet joining us on Sunday, November 1st. Um, his name is Richard Blanco. If, uh, if that name sounds vaguely familiar, but you don't know who it is, it is probably because you watched the second Obama inaugural. He was the first Latino and uh, LGBTQ individual to serve as the inaugural poet. Um, he is Cuban American really amazing, generous human being who is really thoughtful and brings humor into the really hard conversations that we're having as a country, both in poetry and in um, and in prose. Uh, so he'll be joining us on Sunday night at 8 p.m. Uh, in conjunction with the Human Relations Commission and also Reforma, which is the national service organization for um, Latinos in library and information science. Um, so I hope you can join us for that. It's going to be super exciting. His memoir, if you're interested in picking it up to read before the event, is called The Prince of Los Cocuyos. And it is a um, brilliant, 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 brilliant memoir. Highly recommend it. Mm. And then following shortly after that, on November 5th, we have Kendra Allen in, uh, talking about this award-winning collection, When You Learn the Alphabet. Absolutely wonderful, um, wonderful collection of essays. Um, and she'll be with us on November 5th at 7. And um, that's in partnership with our office, the library, and the Black Caucus of the American Library Association. On November 9th, we have Michael Ferris Smith talking about his book, Blackwood. He also has an upcoming book called Nick, which is a retelling of The Great Gatsby from the point of view of Nick. But we'll be mostly talking about this book on November 9th. On November 10th, we are doing a veterans, Prince George's County Veterans Day event with the library and the Office of Veterans Affairs. Do you want me to keep going? I've got two more. Okay. November 18th, we have... Um, NEA Literature Fellow, Dr. Randall Horton, talking about his new collection of poetry, which is right here, number 289128. That is his, uh, was his uh, prisoner number during his incarceration. He's the only tenured professor in the United States with seven felony convictions. We are also gonna talk about his memoir, Hook, which talks about his experience as well um, being incarcerated. Uh, he's actually from this area um, Washington, D.C., Montgomery County area. And the very next night on November 19th, we are speaking to Natasha Trethaway, former poet, U.S. Poet Laureate um, and best-selling author of this memoir, Memorial Drive. And there's more, but that's that'll do us. And for anyone who you know who really wants to go out trick-or-treating but should not because there's a pandemic going on, please encourage them to connect with the library. We've got great events happening all week, uh, every day, every night, pretty much, um, including over on our new PG CMLS Teens Instagram. We have spooky stories being read live by one of our colleagues, Chris uh, Herman, every night um, at about 7 o'clock p.m. So uh, please encourage folks to stay safe on the Halloween occasion, whatever, whatever however you want to interpret Halloween. <laughs> <laughs> or Day of the Dead. I, I'm much more partial to Day of the Dead person, but um, we should have we should come up with an altar next year. Can we can we do a Coco watch party? Can you do that? It's a Pixar film. Can you do a Pixar film watch um, party? We, we could have a we could have a live chat and people would have to watch it on their own, but we could have a start time. That'd okay, be stay tuned. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> See, this is how the stuff comes up. <laughs>
<laughs> well, thanks everyone. We appreciate you. Please uh, keep in touch, check us out on social and thank you. Thank you, Michelle and Kyla for your grace and your leadership with these conversations and for helping us all uh, at least attempt to, to get better personally so that we can serve each other in a more um, honest and, and supportive way. Well, thank you, Nick, for guiding us and leading us. I appreciate all your hard work yeah. for all of the programs that you're behind the scenes on. <laughs> thank you. Happy to serve. Good night, everyone. Good night. Bye. See you, buddy. <laughs>